Hey, Dave from Hooked on Headwater, and today joining me is you know the Hooked on Headwater science guy, Colonel Ken, Colonel Ken Bertadami. He is retired Lieutenant Colonel, Air Force, um, astrophysicist. He's worked for NASA. He's worked in, with the space program. One of the smartest guys I know. Um, he's also, more importantly, he's an avid fisherman, and he knows and understands the science behind fishing. Today, he's going to share about the colors of lures. Do they really make a difference? Really, really um, intriguing discussion. He, he's giving me, a, we, we've chatted about this subject in the past. Um, really, really interesting. Um, take some notes. Uh, you might even save some money when you go buy some lures. So with that said, over to Ken. Great, thanks, uh, Dave. Okay. As Dave said, we're going to talk today about the science behind uh, largemouth bass and their color vision. And then, as uh, Dave alluded to, we're going to get in at the end. I got a couple of special topics. One of them is uh, topwater lures and, and color. All right, so before we uh, jump into the actual uh, science, I want to tell a little story here to kind of set this up a bit. Uh, so, so back when I was in college, back in the 80s, I got involved in a uh, psychology study that the university was doing about uh, superstition and superstitious behavior. Uh, and uh, the reason I got involved is one of the study groups that they were looking at was fishermen. Now you might ask what fishermen have to do with uh, scientific study on superstition. Well, if you think about it, fishermen cross a wide gamut of American society, right? We have young and old, we have rich and poor, famous and not famous men and women, uh, New Yorkers, Southerners, Californians, South Dakota, doesn't matter, it crosses a very large demographic and that's important when you're looking to do uh, psychology science because it tends to smooth out the data and eliminate a lot of these little uh, demographic quirks that may pop up where you only look at a small segment of society and that tends to skew the data and make it very uh, not useful. So because uh, uh, bass, or fishermen in general are such a wide swath of the country, it's a useful uh, group. So anyway, I won't bore you with the whole study, but what the study found that was interesting is fishermen as a group are one of the most superstitious groups they'd ever looked at. Okay, so you're probably asking yourself, what does superstition have to do with bass color vision? Well, it turns out that in addition to superstition, there's a well-known psychological link between people who tend to be superstitious and people who tend to take preconceived notions and in the face of hard science, discount that science and just go with their belief system regardless of what anything is telling them. And that will be important uh, here to today's discussion. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is kind of, regardless of what your preconceived notions about uh, color and bass and that kind of thing. I just put them all aside and just uh, look at the science uh, in of itself and it may lend you to some very interesting uh, different conclusions than you might imagine. All right, and before we jump into the lecture, one little story to help tie this together. If you remember my uh, lecture on bass and uh, there's a moon influence the bass spawn, I was having a discussion online with a very well-known professional bass fisherman about this topic and he insisted that uh, the full moon was the major influence on bass spawning period dot he didn't want to hear anything else he basically told me in the comments section he goes no you're wrong I've been doing this for 30 years that's the way it is fine well not a week later he posts a video for tournament results one of his tournaments and uh, the pre-fishing day, he said, hey, tomorrow is full moon day, so the bass are going to be on beds, I'm going to be spending my day sight fishing, and that's where all the big fish are going to be caught, that's how this tournament's going to be won. Day later, end of day one results, he posts another video, and he goes, well, I spent the whole day, I didn't see a single bass on a single bed anywhere in the lake. And I went, huh. Now, me being me, I could have got online and posted and asked him about his theory about bass and the full moon, but I didn't do that, but I just said, stood back and said, there's a perfect example of where science and the preconceived notion clash, and there's, the moral of that story is there's a lot of other things going on there that he was discounting. Same with this, okay? So let's, let's jump into the, the, the details, but keep in mind there's a lot going on with uh, largemouth bass and color vision. So 
what we're going to talk about, first thing is the outline, and we'll take a quick look at basic anatomy between a largemouth bass and a human eye, because there are uh, lots of structural differences there. We're then going to talk about some astrophysics for bass fishermen, and we're gonna, I'm going to teach you real briefly about the electromagnetic spectrum and why that's important in color vision. We'll then move on to the factors which affect color underwater, since that's the medium that we care about, and it's very different than color vision up in the atmosphere. We'll then take a look at the actual peer-reviewed scientific research into bass color vision, probably the most important thing you'll see in this presentation. And then I'll kind of sum it up. What does this all mean for bass fishermen, right? The science is interesting in a nerdy sort of way, but what does it have to do with being able to go out and, and, and catch bass? And then I'll jump into these two special cases I mentioned. One is topwater lures, and the other is ultraviolet light. And then finally, I'll sum it all up. All right, so here we go. Well, let's move on and jump into our first chart here. So as you can take a look here on the right side, we're going to look at basic anatomy. So humans, as you may or may not know, we have what are called rods and cones receptors in our retina. Okay, the cones we use to distinguish color, and the rods are used to help us see under low light conditions, and they actually help enhance our color vision. As you know, you go look at it at night, the world is not black and white to a human. We can distinguish some color. Okay, largemouth bass, they also have rods and cone receptors like humans. Their cone receptors, however, are different because they're only sensitive to the red and green wavelengths of light. And then in addition, the rods, they support low level light vision, but they don't contribute in any meaningful way to the bass's color vision. So humans have three different types of cone cells, okay? Red, green, and blue. We call that trichromatic vision, if you want to get nerdy about this. And then bass, however, have only two color receptors, green and red. They're missing the blue cone, and they have what's known in biology as dichromatic vision. Now, bass use their eyes to, right, they monitor the ambient light going on in the water. They help pinpoint motion uh, throughout the water column. It helps them determine shape, size, form, and to some extent, color as well. A bass's eye, if you look over to the, the right side of the screen here, is similar to eyes. They have a cornea, they have a lens, and they have a retina. But if you notice, the bass eye is slightly oblong, and ours, of course, is round. Their lens, however, is actually round, and ours is oblong. Uh, they don't possess any eyelids or tear ducts, as I'm sure most bass fishermen know, since none of that is very useful in the underwater environment. Okay, moving on to the next one. So let's talk about the electromagnetic spectrum real simply here. So if you look at the chart here, we'll start all the way on the left is what is known as the short end of the wavelength spectrum and the high energy particles, things like gamma rays at the very far end and x-rays. And then at the very other end of the spectrum are the long wave radiation, low energy, short wave, AM, things like that. And then kind of stuck right in the middle there is what we call the visible light spectrum. For humans, it's visible light. It's what we see. And you know, it goes uh, on the short end from essentially 380 nanometers down in the violet and the purple, all the way up to the red portion of the spectrum. Now, the key point of this whole chart is a little thing in the, in the yellow box here. And that is, I'm gonna, if I take the electromagnetic spectrum in whole and I convert it to the Brooklyn Bridge in length. Okay, the Brooklyn Bridge is 235 feet in length. So let's say the electromagnetic spectrum is now 235 feet from one end to the other. The visible portion of the spectrum that humans can only see is two foot long. So I want you to think about that. What that means is over 99% of the universe is imperceptible to a human. We have no clue what's going on in our universe. We see a tiny, tiny fraction of the universe, less than 1%, which is visible light. Everything else is invisible to humans, okay? So what about the difference here in the next chart between bass and human vision? Again, look at this same, we're not gonna focus kind of in the middle of the chart there. Uh, you know, you can see there the human, again, human vision is visible light. And then the interesting thing, the first interesting thing about bass uh, color vision is that you see, they see a little bit broader version of the electromagnetic spectrum than we do. 
In fact, they see down in the ultraviolet uh, band and into the infrared band as well. And that will have some uh, significant implications in what bats see and don't see and how they see uh, uh, as we go on here. Okay, next, so let's talk about the basics of the physics of how light works, real simply. Everybody knows if you take a prism and you shine white light through it, it breaks it down into its constituent color bands and we can now see the visible color wavelengths from red to violet of the spectrum. So, if we, the thing about light is that if when, when light hits an object, what happens is, is some wavelengths are reflected and some wavelengths are absorbed. That's just the way light photons work when they hit physical objects. Simple example, you take a red crankbait. Why is a crankbait, why is a red crankbait red? Well, what happens is the red frequencies of the light are being reflected off that bait and then every other frequency of light is being absorbed and so the only thing you see is the reflected light, which is red, the red wavelength, so that thing, that crankbait, appears as red. That's how we see things in different colors. So, if you take white light, that means that most of the light is being reflected off that object, okay? If you take black, right, exactly the opposite happens. Basically, all the wavelengths are being absorbed uh, by that particular object, and it appears as black, right? Black and white are not really a color. They're a result of the combination of the different wavelengths. Okay, let's move on a little bit further here. Let's look at the physics of light in water itself. Now, the medium that obviously the bass live in and that we really care about. So basically, the physical properties of water, it turns out that it will absorb light in some fashion or another. And the intensity of this absorption effect is based on the purity of the water and the intensity of the light that you're shining on it. So another interesting fact that people don't necessarily realize about water is that uh, on the water surface, it doesn't really matter whether the surface is flat or whether there's a lot of wave action going on. It has very little effect on how much light actually enters into the water. There was a study done uh, quite a while ago and that study showed that less than 2% of incoming light to a surface of the water is reflected by wave action or anything like that. It doesn't really make any difference whether it's calm or you've got a lot of wind or wave. Most of the light is going to make it through uh, into the water. So illumination, the length of the light path, how far away the source of the light is, uh, particles in the water, particulate matter, all cause a scattering effect and that helps absorb certain colors and not others. Things like salinity, uh, temperature gradients inside the water, all those things reflect what are known as the refractive index of the water or how light penetrates. As uh, probably no surprise to anybody, right, in clearer water, light's gonna reach a much greater depth than if the water is stained or muddy or has high levels of, you know, we get a uh, phytoplankton bloom or an algae bloom, zooplankton, all those kind of things are going to make the light penetrate to a much lower depth than if it's absolutely clear. And again, for you, a little nerdy science here, right, the depth at which 99% of all the light is absorbed in a lake is called the photic zone, and then the depth at which there's no light at all in a body of water is called the aphotic zone. You can press your friends at the bar this weekend if you want, with all those big words. Okay, this is kind of a neat chart I put together. Uh, everybody's probably familiar that different colors of light penetrate different depths into the water before it disappears and turns into basically dark brown or black. And you can see from the chart, uh, reds are the first to disappear, then orange, yellow, green. Blues penetrate the deepest in any body of water, and reds are the shallowest. Uh, one note there, that distance scale is not feet, it's meters, okay? And so what I did is I took some well-known objects that everybody can be familiar with, a Coke can and a sun-kissed can, and I showed you what that object will look like at zero feet, at 10 feet, and at 20 feet under the water. And what you see is, right at zero feet, a Coke can looks bright red. As you get to 20 feet, it kind of looks pretty much grayish. There's no color to it. Same with 
the orange, you got the bright orange sun because at the surface, by 20 feet, you get that slight muddy-ish tinting of orange, but there's still some because orange penetrates deeper than red, and that effect is more pronounced as we go to shorter wavelengths. All right, next here, let's look at the next chart, which is factors that affect the color visibility under the water, because a lot of different things that can affect what the color of the water actually looks like. So if you've noticed, or if you've spent any time out on any bodies of water, whether they're fresh water or salt water, that waters differ in color from a, a wide uh, collection. You look at these two pictures here, uh, and basically it's because of the scattering of light particles and plant life that may or may not be present, you can get very, very different uh, color gradients uh, in the water. Right? Green algae in lakes and rivers, Right? They had turned uh, lakes appear to be this blue-green color when you appear at them from above. Uh, if you take a delta, right, uh, down, like down in the Mississippi, you can get very different uh, noticeable colors and difference from browns to blues based on how much silt and plant material is suspended in the water column. And you can see that uh, in the right side picture there on this chart. So uh, if you've ever been uh, up in the mountains, up in uh, Colorado, or maybe you've been out, been lucky enough to travel over to Sweden and go to the locks and look out there, you'll see lakes and rivers up there. Uh, those lakes and rivers have this very deep blue turquoise color, and a lot of that is by literally finely ground rock material suspended in the water, and they actually call that a glacial flower as a, uh, a locally. If you live here in Florida, you're probably very familiar with that distinct tannic color that we have in many of our bodies of water. Right? This is due to organic matter that falls into uh, the water column, and then over time, it breaks down, and that water gets that tea-stained color. Now, the interesting thing, of course, if you know Florida, is the water is not actually dirty. It's very, very clear, but it looks black. That's just an effect of suspended particles. All right, let's move on to the next chart. So now we're going to talk about the actual peer-reviewed research that's been done into a bass's color vision. So this is actually, believe it or not, has been going on for a very long time. The first study about bass color vision was in 1937. So there's quite a significant body of material on uh, what bass see and don't see. And there have been, a bunch, like I said, a bunch of studies all the way up as recently uh, as uh, 2019 and, and, and 2020. And I want to talk about one in particular that occurred in, in 2019. So in this study, what they did, they took a bunch of bass and they trained them to attack specific targets that were colored differently. So they had these little square targets and they painted them red, green, yellow, blue, black, and a bunch of other different colors. And they trained the bass to go after those uh, individual targets. All right, I won't bore you with all the details of the study, but I'll, I'll summarize what they discovered. So the bass that were trained to attack red targets and green targets, they exhibited a very high degree of what we call color selectivity, which means they were able to, when, when we wanted them to go after the red target, they actually went after the red target. They didn't mistake it for another one. In fact, the red targets were chosen 80% uh, of the time correctly. And the same with the green targets. The green targets were chosen correctly 75% of the time. So very high correlation between uh, those colors and the bass's ability to distinguish that color from every other color. Uh, at the same time, the bass that were trained on the blue targets, they only selected blue correctly 40% of the time, but they selected black 50% of the time. In a similar way, the bass that were trained on white targets only selected white correctly 38% of the time, and they selected sharp truce 30% of the time. Okay, so, they, so essentially they look the same to a bass. All right, so let's take, let's take the study's conclusions and kind of wrap them up into something that, that we can boil it down. So the first thing that the study concluded is, is that outside of red and green, most colors look the same to a bass. Okay? I'm going to repeat that because it's kind of important. Outside of red and green, most colors look the same to a bass. They can't distinguish between other colors. Dark colors look similar to a bass. Black, brown, blue basically look all the same. There was no measurable distinction between those colors for a bass. And in a similar vein, 
bright colors all look similar to a bass as well. Bass were basically incapable of distinguishing between a white target and a chartreuse target, even though to you and I, those are extraordinarily different. So a bass, they were essentially interchangeable. Now, there are a couple, two little caveats with that study. Uh, one, that the test was conducted in ultra clear water. Okay, and so as we just talked about, it's a well-known scientific fact that as the color of the water changes, it becomes dirtier or a different color, that affects uh, the way colors are viewed underwater. However, it doesn't affect it in a good way. In other words, if we did this study in color, in water that was not ultra clear, the bass all of a sudden wouldn't be able to distinguish blue, black, and brown. It would make it even worse than it does now. And then the second one is the tests were actually conducted with very young male bass, eight to 12 inches, one or two year old at most. They did not do any studies with larger bass that were maybe five, six, seven, eight years or more older. And so it just means that there's, it's inconclusive about whether as a bass matures, do they actually develop the ability to uh, distinguish colors? Probably not because they don't grow a blue cone in their retina when they get older and so they still have the, they don't have that ability to see that particular color no matter how old they are but again that's what it's worth noting in that study all right let's move on next one here is so what does this all mean for you and i as bass fishermen if you look at this uh picture on the right i just uh, went into a well-known large retail store and snapped a quick picture of a random section of a shelf. And if you look at that, those are Zoom plastic baits. I think they're probably flukes and, and trick worms or something. But the operative point is there's, there's four, there's like, there's 40 different packages of baits there. And there are 40 different distinct colors. Zoom is one of those companies that's well known for giving fishermen lots of choices in different colors, even though the science demonstrates that none of that actually matters a whole lot. Reds and greens and dark and light is about all bass really can distinguish. But nevertheless, that's what we're faced with as, a, as an industry. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you, number one, how you boil this down, is that lure color selection can be kept relatively simple in bass fishing. Other factors lure profile, size, and action, right, what we call bait presence in the water, are likely to be far more important when you bundle them all together than simply what color lure should I pick? Yeah, right, what's the first thing bass fishermen, you go to the dock when you pull out your water, right? every day I'm at headwaters and I come out, the first question I get asked is, what color was that bait? Not, you know, where were, not even where were you fishing or what type of lure, it was what color was that thing? when in fact color is the last question you probably need to ask when worrying about uh, lure selection. Okay, so lure color in the vast majority of the baits we fish can simply be boiled down into four categories. Green baits, red baits, bright colors, and dark colors. If you stick to those, you essentially cover what a bass can distinguish from a color standpoint uh, underwater. Okay, so let's move on now. I want to talk real quickly about two special cases. One is topwater lures and one is UV light. So we're going to start off with talking about uh, topwater. I'm going to tell you, and hopefully I will convince you by the end of this, that for a topwater lure, color is basically irrelevant. It is something you paint your lures black, green, blue, purple, pink, purple. It doesn't actually make any difference at all. Many other things you should concern yourself with when picking a topwater lure than color. You can be blind and catch 10 pound bass on a topwater lure because color doesn't actually matter. Okay? The, the bait profile that we talked about, its presence and the action you impart in it are an order of magnitude more important. And I use that term in its scientific meaning, an order of magnitude, 10 times more important than simply what color should my top water lure be. So I want you to think about this. Take a bait, it's floating on the surface, okay? Tell me how a bass can see what's on top of the lure that's above the surface of the water. I would say that bass don't have x-ray vision and there's no bass on the planet or any other animal that I'm aware of that can discern what the color of the top of the 
lure is, yet, yeah, if you go look at topwater lures, they have every color, pattern, frog, rainbow trout, squirrel, I mean, you name it, it's just bizarre, yet none of that makes any difference. You could just scratch it off and, and just paint them all black, okay? Uh, but yet, yeah, th that's what we have, we're faced with. Now, the bottom of the lure, right, that's sitting in the water, at best, when looked from below, is a dark, muted, brown, black at best. It's nothing more than a silhouette, okay? And if you're still not convinced that that's the way it really works, if you're a scuba diver, you know this to be true, right? I've been diving for over 30 years, and I've been diving in some places around the world where you're 80 feet to the bottom, gin clear, you can see to the surface. I mean, it's like looking through, you know, clear water. And you go on the anchor line, you sit on the bottom, and you look straight up, and you can see the boat clear as day. Well, I can tell you, what you see is this dark silhouette. There's no color on the bottom. It's just, no matter what color, the bottom boat can be painted white, doesn't make any difference, it's just a silhouette. You don't see any color, okay? Now, if you're a science guy, here's another example. Now, we have a solar, total solar eclipse, and the United States come up in 2024 on April 8th. Now, think about this, right? You look at the moon, and you see color, and you see all sorts of interesting things, yet during the eclipse, when the moon passes in front of the sun, what happens? The moon turns into this black, opaque disk. Well, where'd all the color go? It's still the same. What's going on is the light source is directly behind the moon, and so no light penetrates on the front, or if you're a top water lure, on the top. And you can't see from underneath, it's completely opaque. That's the same effect that's going on with a top water lure sitting on the surface, and something a bass looking from below, trying to look up and discern what color and what they're looking at. All right, hopefully that uh, helps you uh, understand color in top water. So there is one exception. And that is if you pick a color that enhances the contrast of the lure, right, making its profile, its presence bigger, that can be, under certain circumstances, a useful thing. And we know that dark colors in dirty water tend to make a bigger profile. So that's the one exception, or two exceptions, one of two exceptions, where if you're going to fish in very dirty water, top water, it's, you know, people have told you for years, fish black in dark conditions or dark water, fish clear or white in bright sunlight. Well, they probably never told you why, and the reason is, is that dark colors in dark water make a bigger presence, easier for the bass to find it. And the reverse is true, which is why they usually tell you if the water's ultra clear or middle day, fish white or fish a clear bait, because what you're trying to do is reduce the presence, right? In ultra clear waters or highly pressured waters, you're spooking the fish, and so anything you can do to make it harder for the bass to figure out what it is, and if a translucent bait on the surface, he's not getting a great look at it, and you impart the right action, and you get a reaction strike out of them, not a feeding response. Remember, the other scientific fact that people discount is that fisheries biologists will tell you that 75% of every strike during daylight hours of a bass is a reaction strike, not a feeding impulse. So most of the time, we're catching fish, we're doing it. The bass is striking lower for every reason other than they are hungry. They feed mostly at night, particularly nights when the moon is out. Okay, next, let's move on to the last uh, special case here, and that's this interesting case of UV light. We need to do a quick review of UV light and how biology work together. So ultraviolet light, right, it's electromagnetic radiation like I talked about before. It's in the violet portion of the spectrum, and it says a wavelength that's shorter than visible light. It happens to be 10 nanometers, about 400 nanometers, but it's in a, spec, in a section of the electromagnetic spectrum that we, as humans, can't see. Okay? We have three cone receptors, right? The red, green, and blue. Um, we can only detect light in the range of about 400 to 700 man nanometers. Okay? Now, we can see the effects of UV light if you get a specific type, if you get what's called a black light, and it uses a special bulb, and what it does is it causes certain substances to fluoresce or glow, and you can see uh, the ultraviolet effect, but we can't see that wavelength uh, by itself. And then the other thing is most UV light is blocked by the sun anyway, right, by the ozone, otherwise we would, there would be no life on Earth, we would be fried or crisp, so there's not much UV light there anyway. 
Now, there are animals that have been demonstrated that actually do see and proven to see UV light. In fact, there are over 40 species of diurnal birds that can see UV light. Uh, they've used a, a bunch of different techniques. I won't bore you with the details, but they verified that these birds have a fourth cone receptor. They have red, green, blue, and they have an ultraviolet cone, and so they're actually tetrachromatic animals. Uh, there are some species of turtles and bees that also have been proven to be able to see in the UV. So it's not an uncommon thing for other animals to be able to see in UV. All right, so what about largemouth bass? Next here, right? Do they see uh, UV? Well, unfortunately, the research done to date is a little inconclusive about whether they actually see it in one, you know, positive yes or positive no, okay? And so what I've done is I polled four what I'd consider recognized experts in the field, two PhDs and two owners of bait companies and asked them the same very simple question. Can bass see in the UV? And I'm going to give you their answers. Okay? And you'll pardon me, I'm going to read their answers verbatim so it doesn't sound like I'm interjecting anything here. This is exactly what they claim based on their experience. So first up, we have Dr. Keith Jones. He is the director of research at the Berkeley Fish Research Center. Okay? And this is what he said, quote, the bass retina contains only two types of color cones, a red and a green. They do not possess a blue cone and certainly not a UV cone. Moreover, assuming bass follow the pattern of other centra archids, they, their ocular media, the fluid in their eyes, strongly absorb light with wavelength shorter than 450 nanometers, meaning that very little UV light would ever reach their retina in any case. So no, bass do not see UV light, okay? Next up is Dr. Craig, uh, Harashin, professor of biology and at Queen's University in Canada. He's a PhD in their Vision, Science, and Biology Center. And his research uh, actually provided some of the very first evidence that vertebrates actually see in the UV spectrum. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. So here's his quote. One problem here is that no one has measured the spectral sensitivity in the UV spectrum. There is one paper back in 2002 that measured spectral sensitivity of largemouth bass showing blue, green, and red sensitivity, but they did not look into the UV. My suspicion is that they do see UV and have UV cones. They would, they would be capable of detecting UV light even if they did not have UV cones, but that system would be somewhat inferior to one having UV cones. They can potentially see UV light through the beta absorption band in their visual pigments. He goes on to say that this researcher showed clearly that they have blue, green, and red sensitivity visual cones, and it would be logical, therefore, to assume that they have all four color cone types. So, moving on, we, next up we have Cliff Libby, who's the owner of Persuader American Angling. They make uh, weedless spoons using a UV-enhanced technology in which a powder coat UV base is applied, and then they overlay that on a, a digital image of prey. Here's what he said. He said, quote, we found a study done by the Minnesota Department of Fish and Game that talked about fish and UV light. We field tested the spoons at the California Delta and up at Lake Shasta. We had one angler using a spoon without UV and one angler using a spoon with UV. The UV bait would catch around 10 fish to every seven for the non-UV bait. I know damn well that fish can see UV bait down to 50 feet based on our testing. We also use black lights at a trade show to show our customers how the bait lights and lights up when the UV hits it. All right, and lastly, we have Brett Wave, owner of Tightline's UV Bait Company. And they manufacture soft plastic baits that use a proprietary uh, nano-infused polymerization technology in order to reflect UV light, which is supposed to help bass uh, detect their baits better. Here's what he said. He said, quote, absolutely. We use special filters on lights during our test in which only UV light passes through. This light is shown to bass, which follow and react to the presence of UV light. They chase it around just like a cat does when shown a laser pointer. 
We have also done field testing in which one angler uses a bait that does not contain UV-infused color, while another angler uses a bait which does. The bait that contains UV-infused color outfishes the non-UV bait every single time. All right, so some pretty interesting uh, data and unfortunately some contradictory data as well. However, that's not uncommon at this point uh, in this particular field. And what it points to me as a scientist, that just tells me that we need to continue with the research and the experimentation because right now they don't necessarily line up. And typically in science, that just means we need to continue to work on this. See, but there's, I mean, I've talked to many fishermen who absolutely swear, they say there's absolutely UV baits work and others who believe it's just uh, snake oil. Right? And when you talk about snake oil, right, how many of you out there thought that bait scents are snake oil as well? Both of those of you that uh, have bait fuel in your boat, like I do, uh, you know differently, and I'll just leave it at that. And oh, by the way, so does every pro if you're on circuit. Whether they tell you or not, every pro on circuit has a bottle of that in their boat. That should, there's a hint in there somewhere as well. All right, so let's summarize this long-winded discussion here. I'm gonna give you, uh, like we do in the military, three main points to walk away with, and that'll sum everything up. So number one, scientific research clearly shows that with respect to color, bass only distinguish between red, green, dark, and light. Number two, there is mounting evidence that bass also can detect UV wavelengths of light as well. And then finally, when using a top order lure, color is basically irrelevant. And that sums it up. This last chart here is uh, some of the major references I used. Uh, if you wanna go and, and you can't sleep one night, you wanna read these studies, by all means, here's the references, you can look them up and, and read the details uh, for yourself. But I think that pretty much sums it up. Uh, one last thing, just to show you that I practice what I preach, I grabbed a random box out of my uh, boat. This one says uh, stick baits on it. That's right, uh, stapled down here if you live in Florida. And if you take a look, we'll take a look at it. And you can see darks and lights. I don't have any really bright colors. Um, I don't have any whites or anything, but can you? And, and so that's pretty much it, guys. Now, I will tell you, right, that you know, if you have confidence in a bait that is you know, black, and has you know, red uh, speckles in it, I'm not gonna tell you you shouldn't do that, right? That, that's okay as well, particularly if you have confidence, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna probably use it better and, and fish it correctly. But there is no reason to have 30 different colors of stick baits and 20 different colors of crank baits and, and on and on and on, right? And regardless of the fact that we understand this, I'm sure I can go to any random 10 guys bass boats and open up their boxes and you probably, and, and if I let out all your baits, I guarantee you, you'd have 70 or more distinct colors of baits, right? When we don't need that many. So if you want to get rid of your baits, uh, Dave will leave my Link in front, you can send them all to me. But uh, <laughs> seriously, just, I mean, I'm not telling you to get rid of all your baits, but as you're going forward, think about you can really reduce the colors of baits and focus more on profile and the action of the bait, not what color do I need, because it doesn't, if you stick to those four categories, that's pretty much all bass can see. So okay. Okay, with this, um, is there a difference in saltwater fishing? Um, the, it, the, uh, from, the, from the studies that I looked at, it did not, the salinity did not make a lot of difference in, now, right, there are no largemouth bass in, uh, in seawater, so these studies that uh, we're looking at were, were, were freshwater fish, specifically largemouth bass. I didn't see any studies, mostly because I wasn't looking for them, about uh, saltwater game fish, how they perceive color, uh, I thought I've read some things that they've not seen in, in any major game fish species that have anything other than red and green receptors. So I suspect it's pretty similar. Okay. Welcome here. I want to thank Ken for this really intriguing subject. I'm sure you guys, some have your opinions. And hey, let us know. Comment down, down below if you have questions for Ken. Comment down below. He, he's a he's a head, hooked on headwater science guy. He will 
get back to you with a, with a res response Absolutely. one way or the other. Absolutely. So enjoy the video. Very informative. I will watch it again. Take some notes. You might even save some money next time you go buy some, <laughs> some bait. So with that said, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Appreciate sir. Appreciate it. You bet. A great, great talk. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.